All right, so this is Omri Misgav, and he is going to talk about running rootkits like a nation state hacker. Hi, everyone. Uh, good morning. Uh, as I was introduced, my name is Omri. Uh, I work uh, at Fortinet in Israel. Uh, most of my work is around uh, OS security and OS internals. Um, today, I'm going to talk about a bit uh, about uh, driver signing enforcement um, and uh, basically how it works, um, how it works, the internals of it, how attackers abuse it, uh, what Microsoft tried to, de to do in order to prevent it, and then we'll talk about some uh, uh, new tradecraft. Hopefully, that uh, we'll also run some uh, live demos and everything uh, will go as planned. So what is uh, DST? Um, basically, uh, there is a feature in Windows that is called Code Integrity. Um, it is used for uh, threat protection. Um, basically, uh, it's used to sign code, and some aspects of it means that uh, in order to sign, in order to run drivers in the kernel, now you have to sign them, uh, to digitally sign them. And every time you want to execute a driver, Basically, the uh, operating system will check its signature, will verify it, and by that we can improve the security of the OS. Uh, we can know uh, from where drivers uh, originated, uh, who are the authors, and if we trust them, and make sure that they were not modified on the way um, sometime after they were built. Um, moreover, um, the signing is not something that just everybody can do. Um, you used to need a specific uh, code signing certificate uh, that came only from a handful uh, of approved sources. And over the years, uh, there was another limitation that was added by Microsoft that you had to give them your driver for them to sign it. Uh, but, and without their signature, it won't work. You won't be able to run it. Um, which, if you think about it, for attackers is not really ideal. Um, you just hand over your payload to the defenders. It's not really a place you want to be in. So how does it work uh, in, 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 uh, in practice? Basically, when the system boots up, um, if you can see the, um, the call stuck on the left, uh, at a certain point, the kernel uh, will mark the uh, CI, CI enabled flag as uh, set to true, and it will call another uh, library in the kernel that is called CI DLL, and it will give him, it will give this uh, uh, this uh, initialization function that the, that is exported by the DLL. It will give it a callback structure that it will fill, um, that the DLL itself will fill with callbacks for the kernel to, let, to use later on. Uh, and the DLL will also set its internal state to be uh, set is on. Um, next up, when a driver will be loaded, uh, you can see the call, the call uh, stuck on the middle. Um, basically, uh, when it's going to be mapped into memory, there are a couple of uh, uh, wrapper functions that will be called. Um, basically, those are just very simple uh, wrappers for the callbacks that CI DLL provides. Um, and what they do, we can see on the right, uh, on the right uh, side on the disassembly. Basically, they, ch they check the flags, um, they check the, the global flags to, to see if the uh, code integrity is enabled, and then they just check that the, the callback is uh, valid, that it's not point, a null pointer, and that's pretty much it. Um, both both functions that well, both callbacks that will be called is the validate image header and validate uh, image data. Um, and that's, that's pretty much how it works. Um, there have been a few changes along the years. What I dis just described was mainly for Windows 7. Um, the changes are really, really small. Um, so from Windows 8, basically, the enable uh, flag was uh, removed. So right now, the state of the driver signing enforcement is only um, set in the CI DLL. And there are more callbacks that uh, CI DLL now provides, uh, but they are not really um, important for our case. Um, 
and because of the because there are more callbacks that are used, then some some offsets in the structure change. But basically, um, from Windows 8 till today, there wasn't uh, any uh, critical change for us. Uh, one other thing that is important here is that basically, um, r right now there is only a single function that will be called, a single uh, callback that will be called when the driver will, will, be, will be loaded. So, um, how is how it's been abused in the wild? Um, basically, uh, we go, we or mainly attackers go uh, in order to load their uh, driver, uh, which is usually unsigned or untrusted, and they just go and flip the bit of the flag. Uh, depends on the operating system uh, build. Uh, they'll just write to it uh, f a value that will disable it, and then uh, they uh, they gonna load their driver and uh, restore um, the original uh, state. The way it's being done is that um, all of those variables, all of those callbacks are basically internals, internal structures, they are private, they are not exported in any way, in any way uh, but they can be easily found with a simple uh, pattern uh, matching. Um, again, with barely any change between uh, all the Windows builds. And uh, in order to be able to write to the kernel, um, basically, uh, they bring their own driver or bring their own vulnerable driver and they just leverage it in order uh, to gain uh, right permissions to the kernel. Um, it has a lot of, uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, pros to it because it means that we can just uh, reuse uh, this capability uh, no matter when we want to. So a few uh, steps that Microsoft tried to uh, to implement in order to fight this thing is basically is first apply patch guard to it um, from Windows 8 and Windows 8.1. There were improvements. Um, they try to block now. They try to block uh, attackers uh, from gaining the right primitive. Uh, basically, they deploy uh, driver block lists, um, which is uh, effective, but there is a problem with it because it doesn't cover what we don't know. If we find a new driver that is vulnerable, um, if the attackers find it, so they can use it and everything will just go on. And the major change that we tried to introduce uh, with Windows 11 was uh, basically using uh, KDP, um, Kernel Data Protection. It's a new feature uh, based on, the on uh, VBS on the VBS architecture, uh, basically leverages the hypervisor in order to uh, enforce uh, uh, read-only permissions on specific pages. Uh, and they let drivers, other drivers use it as well, um, and or other kernel components. And that's pretty much uh, what they did with Windows 11. Um, now CI DLL was uh, tweaked a bit. Um, basically, uh, we can see that CI options is now uh, being provided as a parameter to the KDP API. Um, and the global variable uh, was moved to its own uh, page, um, which is called now CI policy. Uh, it's a very, it's like a unique section in the PE that it's found in. So, uh, just to recap for a second uh, before we get into the new stuff. Um, basically, uh, how the DSC tampering works is we locate something that uh, we need to change, then we overwrite it, we load the driver and revert back. Um, we're going to focus on the main, on the first two uh, uh, points here. Um, with our main goal is basically be able to change some data uh, and not touch any code pages or mo modify any executable pages whatsoever. The first technique, um, it has a very uh, creative name for it. It's called page swapping. Um, basically, because uh, the protected page, um, we cannot write to it because there is another set of permissions that is being enforced on uh, in the slot PT. Uh, Basically, we can't try to it no matter what we'll do. Uh, we can see the illustration here. 
of the mapping, uh, but still KDP doesn't really uh, enforce the way that the virtual memory is being mapped uh, uh, to the physical memory at the end. Uh, it tried to do something like patch guard that it goes on periodically and try to verify it, but since it's periodically, we can still ma make some uh, short-lived changes. Um, so instead, we're going to create our own, uh, our own page, our own copy of the page, uh, and we'll make it writable. So we can set whatever value we want to it, and then uh, we'll set DSC as off in this page, um, and then we just need to somehow uh, make the same uh, virtual address for the original uh, uh, variable uh, to change its value to it. Uh, for that, we just need to change the page table, and basically, uh, we only write the uh, address of the PTE, of the PFN there, and then to, uh, the next time the virtual address will be used, it will go uh, to, our to the page that we control and set the value. So, just to uh, go through the steps by steps here, uh, we allocate a new page. We need to find uh, the, the, alloc the page we, we allocate is in the kernel. We need to find the CI options flags uh, just as, we, as, as is currently done in the wild. There's nothing new about it here. Uh, we need to read the PTE base. Um, just a short explanation on this. Basically, the, the page tables are also found in the virtual address space in the kernel um, with simple... Uh, uh, a bit, bitwise calculation, we can basically convert the virtual address uh, that we need to, uh, that we want to access and find its uh, matching uh, PTE for it. Um, there is a problem with it. Um, basically, uh, the, the, the address space is now uh, randomized, um, but uh, it's a very good thing that uh, I already had some research in the past that uh, covered it. Um, so we can just uh, read the new PTE base uh, with a single read from kernel uh, using an exported function in uh, Entos, as we can see here. Then we go on and read uh, the PTEs uh, that we need to change, the PTE for the original page and the PTE for the page we allocated. Then we need to copy the page because if we're going to swap the page uh, in order for anything else not to break, we need to copy the entire values there uh, because we don't really know what's, what, what, uh, what other things are in the page itself. Uh, the flag itself is only four bytes. The page size is uh, four kilobytes. We need to modify the value in order to set it uh, as, uh, to, to turn it off. And then, um, Basically, just switch the PFNs as we showed earlier, load the driver, and uh, restore the uh, PT. So this is pretty complicated. Um, when I worked on it, I wasn't really happy, uh, so I tried to figure out some other way to uh, solve it and make it a bit more uh, feasible to use. And with a few very slight changes, it's very easy to do. Um, basically, instead of allocating a, a page in kernel, we're going to allocate a page in user space. And then everything we need to locate just remains the same. Uh, instead of copying the page and doing a lot of uh, kernel reads, we can just, in the case of CIDLL, since the uh, variable was moved to its own unique page, uh, we can just like uh, use the default values uh, for this page. Um, most of them are just zeros, and just set the value that we need uh, for the flag. Uh, and then, again, change the PFN, load the driver, and restore it. So, demo time. Let's see. I have a, a Windows 11 build here, an inside preview build from like two weeks ago. We'll boot up in a second. Uh, the first thing I'm going to show you is that we we'll see the build number and we'll see that VBS is running. Uh, but the only thing that is being enabled is uh, Credential Guard. 
KDP doesn't appear here for some reason. Um, so the first thing we're going to show is basically that the current technique in the wild um, doesn't work. So here we're going to expect a blue screen. Yay. Uh, we can see that it's blocked on the right. And let's see. Revert back. Second. Okay. So now I have my rootkit over here. And just show you that it's unsigned. And we're going to quickly install it. We'll try and run it and see it doesn't run. We get an error. We'll run the page swapping. And now it runs. You can see the output here. You can see print by the rootkit itself. And I stopped it. And now I'll try to run it again and I'll get an error. OK. So. This is the first technique. It's pretty complicated to uh, implement. It involves both read and in read, and reads and writes to the kernel. And we wanted to find a different method to do it uh, that won't uh, be as complicated as that. Uh, so we found another way. Uh, if we look on the, basically on how the callbacks work. So um, there is some address that uh, basically calls CI uh, DLL and this callback needs to return us zero. Okay. Well, sorry. It's need, it needs to return zero. And now instead of uh, just calling to the, to the main, to the entry point of the function, uh, maybe we can just replace this functionality and get like some other uh, point, uh, some other way to uh, return zero. And then it will just work as the same, and the, uh, op the uh, authorization of the, deal of the driver will work. So the, we, we're basically going to swap the callbacks, but we need to find out how to do it. Um, so first, we need to find the, callback, the global callback structure. It's very easy to do because um, CI initialize is, is uh, imported by the kernel, so we can just find. Uh, referenced in the uh, import address uh, table for it. Uh, from there, uh, from there, we need to go back and find uh, the register assignment for it. And basically, um, when we do, we see that the address will point to initialize to uninitialized memory in data section. Uh, now we need to find a new replacement callback, uh, which is pretty easy to do because all we need to return is zero. Uh, there are exported functions in the kernel for this, and if we don't want to go that far, uh, we can just use CI DLL itself and look for gadgets or exported functions in it. Um, now we need to find the way to restore uh, the original uh, callbacks, and that's important so we can just do this entire technique without any kernel reads. Um, so the uh, the pattern that use, is used to initialize the callback uh, structure is pretty much the same in every build, so we can just look for it. And then we get a list of addresses that we need to actually verify that um, they are functions, so we can basically traverse the exception uh, directory and look for uh, entries that are, uh, are uh, basically a func uh, uh, function uh, start addresses, and then we know that we got to the right place. 
So then we need to set the callback, which is pretty easy. Um, load the driver and restore the callbacks again. Go back for a quick demo. So So right now I disable DC and then we see that our our rootkit is back running after we didn't manage to run it. We'll re-enable DC. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Can't see it. Yeah, so it's stopped as we can see now. And we can't run it again. So I'm a bit out of time, so I'll try to go quickly about these two, new, two uh, next slides. Um, we can see that basically we managed to find some. Uh, we managed to find a, a, a new technique that is pretty synonymous to uh, the existing one in the wild. Um, there is a way to mitigate it. Uh, basically, what we su what we uh, uh, suggest is like try and find um, these all of these uh, internal states, internal variables uh, ourselves, just as attackers do. And there is no reason not to do it. It was proven as uh, stable. Um, till now at least. Uh, we can copy the state of the variables and then uh, just retest them again and again every time a driver is loaded. Um, it's also easy to prevent because once we see that there is a change in the variables, we can either block the I/O operation or just restore the variables to the original state and let the operating system do the work uh, for us. And just to sum it up, um, basically, uh, DC tampering is still feasible, even with every, everything Microsoft attempted to do uh, here. Um, doing, like providing um, data-oriented mitigations are pretty difficult, uh, as you can see. Um, the real solution for it at the end is called uh, HVCI. It's another feature that Microsoft uh, provided uh, on top of uh, VBS. It's a very old feature. It's like there from the beginning, and it pretty much covers every aspect of it. Because what it does is um, basically do, uh, basically have the entire validation uh, process being done twice: once in the uh, kernel itself by CI/DLL, and then it holds a copy of the policy uh, in the secure area that the kernel can uh, can touch, and it basically does the entire. Uh, validation there, and only then it provides the uh, execution permission. So without that validation, nothing will work. Um, and that's uh, it. Uh, you can check out our blog for additional data, and we're done. Thank you.